you talk about postpartum depression that you experienced and and how and you describe it and i'm gonna do a terrible job of explaining this but you describe it through the specificity of your hands yeah and you're going through depression and it was one of those things where i was like oh you you have this really specific approach which is um uh attacking a really macro idea with mundane smaller things yeah and i was just curious like how do you arrive at that well i honestly i think that it comes from like i can't interpret postpartum depression for anybody else i can't interpret most common shared experiences through any other lens of my own and so to me it's like if i try and personalize something so big to so small as like this is how i experience this thing in one part of my brain, I'm like, well, then that's not relevant to anybody else because that's just your experience. But in doing that and breaking it to such a like a molecular level of like my postpartum depression was experienced and started to, I kind of like found my way out of it by looking in my hands and going, these are the same hands you got married with. Like people hear that and though it feels so personal to me, they're like, no, I have felt that too. Yeah. But because it's so specific, they feel like you're reading their mind. Yeah. And that is like an instant connection point. It's not, I'm not trying to manipulate anybody. I'm not trying to like make this relatable. I just, I want to give people such specific information about my life and my feelings and the way I experience something so that just on the off chance that they have also experienced that, I don't have to explain to you anything else about postpartum depression. Yeah. And I know, or you know that I know that we have experienced the same thing. Yeah. And like, that's my goal is like, I want to talk about big things, big things, but make them feel like you're reading my diary in like yeah. a non-traumatic way. <laughs> like yeah. not like so uncomfortable that you're like, I shouldn't be reading this, but yeah. like so personal that you're like, me too, same. And it's interesting because like, you're talking about like using the specific to convey a universal and like, that's you know that's an idea that people talk about in writing all the time but you do it so effectively and because i found like when i was hearing you tell that story i'm like oh yeah i totally know what she means and yet i did not do that yeah i did not look at my hands i did not blah, right. blah, blah. but for me it's like kind of like my sleepwalking story where it's like i jumped through a second story window very few people have done that right <laughs> um, but but i, I think hope not a lot yeah, yeah. but hopefully you tell i tell the story in a way where people go Oh, I have a thing like that where I'm uncomfortable telling that right. about myself. Well, you the way that you do, and I, I feel like we're similar in this, is that you're not talking so much about the experience. You're talking about how you internalized it. Yeah. And that is what makes it relatable as well. Because it's like someone doesn't have to have had to jump out of a second story window, but you can explain how it felt, what you were thinking. And like yeah. that whole, that's a whole journey that you can feel about messing up someone else's name when like calling out their coffee order. That yeah. doesn't have to be so extreme. Like yeah. someone with anxiety can literally feel like messing up someone's name is like jumping out of a second story window. And yes. like, those are the same feelings. And so being able to in, to express that internal dialogue that's happening with you in your life is like the most crucial part, I think, of making any situation relatable to somebody. Yeah. And like, it's interesting, like there, Jessica Gross wrote this piece in the Times recently about, um, she was talking about Maggie Smith's book that just came out and John Mulaney's comedy special that just came out and um, and how both of them call out that they're telling autobiographical stories, but this is what I'm, this is the part I'm choosing to tell you. Mm. And, um, and they just hang a lantern on it. Yeah. And that was really interesting. It's like, I was thinking about with your stuff, like, do you have like do you have a code for yourself of like I'm not going to talk about these things? I think that some of it is a feeling, some of it's pre like decided. I think that if it's not my story to tell, that's an immediate no. Like if it's not yeah. if I'm breaking the like crossing a line of like sharing information that it's just not mine. Like that's not a story I tell, but then there's stuff that is mine to tell, but it directly affects people that I love and that's if, the, if they're not the ones that have decided to be in this position and in the spotlight, like they've not asked for this life. Like, yeah. so that's not fair either. So there's there's some of that. And then some of it's like, I just want my some of my life to be private. Yeah. And, and I want my family to feel like we're still a family and it's yeah. not the three of us and then the rest of the world as well, also in our home all the time. Yeah. And so a lot of it is like just between me and my husband, like we share stories about us. We don't really talk about our son very much or like, yeah. um, yeah, we, we try and have these like very loose boundaries that are probably going to change and, and sometimes grow and sometimes get 
much closer and you know keep things more close to us but I know that there are things that we don't share, but it's kind of just a figure it out as we go. But some things you just have a gut feeling of like, this just isn't my story to tell. Yeah. Do, do you have a very clear cut my, answer? Mine's pretty clear. It's like, there's people in my life who I talk about a lot, like my wife, Jenny, and our daughter, Una, um, and my brother, Joe, and my parents. And, uh, but I, but uh, yeah, I'm not, you know, I don't post photos of my daughter yeah. and like that. I, I feel like that's her life. Right. And I, I, and I think increasingly I'm talking less about her. Like in the last show, yeah, she has like five or six lines. Whereas in the new one, when she was a baby, oh, man. I feel like it's, it's, it could be any baby, the things. That yeah. Yeah. Occur, yeah. You know what I mean? I'm curious, like for you specifically, and I know that's your podcast, so you can cut all this up, but like, yeah. how, what is it like doing all of this while still having a family and like, how do you how do you balance that? Because I'm trying to find that right now. Um, I don't think it's possible. Okay, that's a really honest answer. Some bad news for you. <laughs> Thank you. No, I Not think possible. I mean one thing I'm lucky about is is that my wife Jenny is a poet and and she reads my stuff and I read her stuff and yeah. we we interact on you know and so if she, if there's stuff that she doesn't like and. I didn't say that. I said more like this and blah, blah, blah. We, we talk it out. And a lot That's of times cool. over the years, you know, with the new one, she was a writer, accredited writer on the show. And, and, and it's like, I feel like we get through it, but it's also doesn't mean it's not challenging. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's definitely like, you know, because I have, I, you know, in marriage, you have two people who are witnessing almost identical events yeah. and remembering them two very different ways. Yeah. <laughs> Hundred percent. Yeah. <laughs> so like. <laughs> oh my gosh! Yes. So I'm, like, yeah. I have a joke, and I'll, usually I do this in the material section, but I'll just say a joke yeah. that I have that's new at my show, which is like, many years ago we were in Chicago, Jenny and I are on an elevator, a hotel elevator coming down. We had stayed in the hotel before, and I said to her, "I go, I go." It just occurred to me. Oh. We stayed in this hotel before, and, and you loved the cafe in the lobby. And then her response was, she goes, who did? And I was like, oh, no, because who did? The She's sub- like, who else did you stay here with? Right. You got that very quickly. Sometimes <laughs> audiences don't get it as quickly. So the subtext of it is, A, uh, that didn't, you know, that wasn't me. That B, that must have been someone else you were seeing. See, I'm not happy about this. And we get to the lobby, doors open, and uh, she goes, "I love this cafe." And I was like, "I almost died in the elevator." <laughs> and you just <laughs> casually remembered that I'm right. So anyway, so now Jenny and I, we have a safe word in our marriage, and it's "who did," and it's when we re- we remember an event differently. Wow. Yeah, it's. It's 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 involved. That is a very that's a so many layers because I could see someone interpreting that as like, did I love it or did you love it, or like, did I love it or did someone else that you saw stayed here with love it? Oh yeah, that's that's how I would have interpreted the who did first, but then right. the second time, no, that's it, he thought it was someone else. That's the thing about I mean, in, this speaks to storytelling in a general sense too. It's like, it's like. We're all remembering things in different ways. Oh, absolutely. The way we perceive everything. Like, like I'm very visual. Yeah. And Jen has an extraordinary sense of hearing and smell. And my sense of smell is junk. Great. Right? (laughs) Love that for you. (laughs) I love that for you. (laughs) So, like, she'll be like, I smell mildew. And I'm like, I smell nothing. (laughs) I haven't smelled anything for years. Yeah. (laughs) First of all, I am the smell, 100%. Jo- yeah. Jonas is the auditory. I am the smell. I am the long-term memory. Jonas is the short-term memory. Like, I cannot remember what happened yesterday, but I could literally word for word, detail for detail, tell you the time that I, like, sucked on a penny to get out of school and ended up actually accidentally faking an appendicitis. And every single thing the doctors so said, slept like... slept on a penny? Sucked on a penny. Sucked on a penny. I heard okay. a... Yeah, yeah. I heard a rumor that if you sucked on a penny, it would make your mouth really hot. And you remember, like, the temperature, like, thermometers that, yeah. that had the blue dots that you, like... Sure. Yeah, and so it, it like was off the charts, and she's like, "Oh my gosh!" So then did a digital one, and then she was like, 
you need to go to the hospital right now. Like 110 degree, like so hot from this penny. Wow. Have you heard that? Do you ever hear this story? I've heard, no, no, I've oh, Okay. Heard well, so then, yeah, so then I, so then I'm like faking it and I'm really trying to sell it because my first two friends went in before me and they yeah. couldn't sell it. And yeah. so I was like, well, it's up to me now. You know what I mean? I really want to go home. So now I'm like, I'm very unwell. And she's like, you need to go to the doctor. And mm-hmm. I'm like, that's not what, I just wanted to go home. I don't want to go to the doctor. Right. That like ruins the whole point. Yeah. So then I am going to the doctor and the doc, and I'm like, now I'm like, I have a side ache, like my lower, my side. And, and my doctor's like, you need to try, take her across the street to like the pediatrician, like hospital, like, or uh, you know, child hospital right now. And how old are you at this point? I'm in second grade. Oh, wow. Like, re- and then now I'm trying to like, from the doctors, to the hospital, trying to tell them like, I was lying, but now they think I'm telling the, I'm like lying about lying because they think right. I just don't want to go to the hospital. Right. And they were like, you definitely have an appendicitis. You're in denial. And I was like, I do not. Yeah. I just wanted a day off. Like, please oh. do not like take me to the hospital. I was admitted for three days no. because they could not believe that I was lying because I kept, they just were, thought I was afraid. At that point, you had told them. Everyone. I had told everybody. I, I was, and, I tried to fake yeah. you out. I and tried they were to like, just go home. Well, now we have to check. Because uh, because it, with a kid, they're very cautious about like parent and child dynamic and like, oh are you safe at home? Like all of that. So all of that was happening and I'm just... I, I just felt so bad and I'm trying to tell my mom I'm, I lied. So she's trying to tell them that I lied. And then that makes it look worse because if a parent's like, their kids are lying, then that's like, makes it even, it was right. it was a whole situation. And Why finally I got lying? out. Yeah. And I, I shared a room Why with a girl. Why do they feel like they have to lie? Yes. Why, do, why, does she need, why does she need to lie to get out of school? Like all of it. <laughs> and I shared um, a room with a girl that was actually like had an appendicitis and it was like, I'm, a, I'm about to burst. Like get, excuse me, get me out of here. Like my appendix doesn't want to be in my body anymore. And I'm just sitting there like, can I order another thing of mashed potatoes? Because those yes. were so good. Oh my gosh. <laughs> like, yeah, so I got my day off. You were but, there for um, three days. Three days. Oh my gosh. I don't remember why I started that story. Oh, the sucked on a penny. Memory. Oh, memory. Yep. Yeah. So there you go. See, no short term memory, but I have a very good one. <laughs> <laughs> See? <laughs> See? <laughs> why were you saying? Yeah. Why were you? you th- that is. Why were we talking about that? Memory. See? See? Very strong. That was great. Very strong. And seen. And this is our improv group. It's yeah. Mike. It's the Mike and the Lee show. There we go. <laughs> that, that's why I emailed you this week, though. I go, I was like, I was listening to our episode. And we talk about how you don't perform on stage. Yeah. And I think you're a wonderful storyteller, and I feel like you could really connect with people in a per- if you were in a room with them in a way that what you do on on socials is is deep. But I think that in a room could be deep in a different way. Yeah. And you, <laughs> and on a, on your podcast, which I love, uh, <laughs> you said I'm just terrified of of terrified being in front of people. And then I was like, so then I was, I'm doing a bunch of shows. I'm working on new material. And I was like, you know, you could just, if you wanted to, you could just pop in, be an unbilled guest. You know, no one would know you. It would just be like, my friend Elise is here. She's going to tell a story for seven minutes and whatever. And then you could, then you wouldn't be afraid of it anymore. And then you were like. That's definitely how it works too. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) You've definitely acted. Ah, (laughs) Burned. Burned. uh, That's on me. That's not on you. I love that you're so confident in yourself that you're like, and then it's done. You're cured. And then that's it. <laughs> Weirdly, I believe that to be true. And I stand by it. I, I believe I believe that you believe that. 100%. A, a, a burned man <laughs> no. standing before you. You're I, I, I double down. No. I double down that is, it. But that is why you're doing what you're doing. Is because you be, you have such confidence. And I know I can. I'm not. I don't think I can't do it. I know I can do it. Of course and you like, can do it. It's the. It's. You want to know what it is? Honestly, it's the fear that like, I can't blame it on anyone else but me. I get that. And with online, I don't have to have any immediate reaction from anybody. I tell a story that I find funny. And if you don't like it, then you're just not going to see the, the video. And that's fine because I don't have to see your reaction. I don't have to go in the comments. I can yeah. blame it on the algorithm if it doesn't do well. Like yeah. there are so many things that, that can play into a video not getting seen. And so... If I am standing in front of an audience and I say something and it is silent, I think I would just start crying. Like, like genuinely, I, I am so 
I, I fake so much confidence that yeah. that would be a moment I could feel that a confidence would genuinely crumble. Yes. Now, will that stop me from doing it? No, because like I do not want there to be anything in my life that I was like too afraid to do, so yeah. I just didn't do it. So I want to get to that point, but yeah. but now it's to the point where it's like the skill of writing a set that is concise and like performable in front of people and not edit edited. Like that is what I don't have. And so I don't I wouldn't even know where to start. If you're to be like, here's seven well, minutes. I'll tell you where to start. Yes. So you take the story you just told, uh, about faking sick, and you just memorize it. You already know it. Yeah. You go on stage in an environment like being a guest at one of my shows where like pe people aren't expecting to see you and yeah, they yeah, go, yeah. Oh, okay, what's this? You do three minutes, you tell that story. I'm just gonna tell you one story tonight and it might not be funny. And then you tell the story, <laughs> you walk off stage and but you go, don't you have ah, to... there's a couple laughs. There's a laugh, uh -huh. here's a laugh, here's a laugh, here's a laugh, here. How come this didn't get a laugh? And then you start mm. to take it apart and just go like, like, oh, okay, if I supplemented a joke here or I dropped in a joke that I tell usually in another story, here or yeah. at color here and i think like because because here's my question to you is like it's like what like in your mind what's the worst thing that can happen like if i if i if i threw you on stage in a black box theater with 100 people in the audience like what like and and it's like hey just do walk up and tell a story for three or four minutes just yeah. like we're doing now but there's 100 people what's yeah the worst thing that can happen i think honestly the worst thing that could happen is like well, I'm terrified of fainting in front of a bunch of people. <laughs> That's, a good, That's like a good number answer, one good thing. Answer. But second, like, I don't know how you do it with like, if someone has one impression of you, that's the only time they're ever gonna might see you on yeah. and a performance and they're gonna walk away and that is the thing they're gonna remember about you. And yes. that's hard to change once somebody has formed an opinion of like, she's not good at this. Yeah. Like, it's really hard to come back from that versus like someone being really good at something once and then being terrible at it the next time being like, oh, but she's actually good. Like I saw her last time, she's really good. So I don't, I that's just a confidence thing too. Like, like not caring, like. I'm gonna do a double step. Uh, process for you getting on stage because okay. I'm taking I'm taking apart all of the I love this I'm taking away all the very well they they say this I mean this is like an old thing in sales it's like it's like if someone doesn't want to buy something go take through all, all yeah all take yeah. all their objections be like okay what about this what about this how you yeah know? and with yours it's like okay well people will be like oh she's not good at this well then we do a thing where I do a show somewhere you're not billed no one knows you're there. What I does go, that mean, build? People, it's not featuring Elise okay, Myers. Okay. I thought you meant like invoice, like <laughs> like I'm gonna bill her for that. I'm just like, I didn't realize that's how that worked. That feels backwards. So I charge you <laughs> yeah. $40,000 to walk on stage with me because honestly, yeah. it's gonna pay off in the long it term. It is, it's an investment in your future. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like you're the on my thing. stage, this is great for you, it's all my, of it. It's my weird pyramid scheme in, the, in my middle age. And you go and get, you get 10 comedians and you can take a cut of that 40 grand. <laughs> And at you, the end of the day, you'll be a millionaire. You have a real conspiratorial mind, Elise Myers. <laughs> I'm just afraid of everything. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you're really, you're really throwing punches where there's no foe. I've seen so many documentaries about MLMs. Yes, exactly. It's amazing. Oh, no, so here's the plan. Here's yep. the plan. You, so we're in Madison. You're unbilled. In other words, it doesn't say Elise Myers anywhere on the thing. Yeah. It's just a Mike Birbiglia show. Um, in the middle of the show, you go, oh. My friend is here tonight. She's one of my favorite storytellers. I'm gonna bring her on stage. Please welcome my buddy, Elise Myers. And she, you come on stage. We have two microphones. I go, will you tell the story about this? You tell the story, we're both on stage. And then you're like, oh, okay. And then, then it's like the two person thing. That's and really then you go, cool. well, what would it be like if it was one person, just me, the next time? Wow. It's like a stair step. I really like that. I really like that. I think honestly, like, any anything is possible. It's not. I I really ge genuinely feel like the fear, the fears that you're asking me about. I'm telling you about yeah. aren't things that are going to keep me from doing it from this point forward. Yeah. It's just like this is the irrational thing that's happening in my brain that gets in the way as I try and write. And so the longer that I've been in this career too, and the more people I've met, and the bigger the crowds that I've I've spoken to, just mm -hmm. about like even yesterday the event things oh, like so that. Oh, so you've like, done that, which is the same thing basically. Yeah. Oh, oh sorry. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not. It. But the the pressure. Like to you make didn't event right. You didn't laugh. event. You didn't event yesterday where you were kind of on a panel. 
Right. Yeah. It was yeah. me. Someone asking just me questions. Yeah. Right. But the the pressure to be funny that is the part that is like the the scary part for me because right. I can I feel very comfortable talking. It's like it's just I don't know. It's like this weird. Um, it's like when I when I get asked to like act in something, I'm yes. aware that you know I'm acting, and so I feel like I'm lying, and you're like she's lying, she's yeah, acting, yeah. this isn't her. So the 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 weird understanding of like I'm at a comedy show and this person's gonna make me laugh is that is what's interesting because that that pressure isn't in a in a TikTok because nobody knows the point of a video when it starts. Okay, it, whatever happens in the video happens, and it's like. So so at a comedy show, the expectation is like, you need to be funny, you need to make me laugh. Mm-hmm. And then that's where I feel like if I don't meet that, I've totally failed. But it's just, that that just comes from an experience. And so um, I think that learning how to structure a story and, and honestly, I was gonna ask you like, so if I were to tell a story on a stage, the because it's like the punchline situation, like yeah. um, <laughs> the punchline like, situation. I mean, I mean, like the actual that joke be the name part. Of your comedy <laughs> the album. whole this whole punchline situation. Yeah, yeah. Look, listen. <laughs> and if I always fail, just like go to like Jerry Seinfeld. Like, you like jazz? Like, just go straight there. <laughs> it's like the comedy equivalent of like. And then I found five dollars, kind of a thing. But anyways, um, I don't follow that. Oh, <laughs> like, what? have you ever been telling a? Whore? Maybe it's not a well-known thing. Maybe it's my <laughs> brothers and me. You know, like when you're telling a story and someone's like, this is not an interesting story. And then you're like, and then I found five dollars. Oh, that's very funny. Yeah. I like that a lot. <laughs> and then someone's like, oh, my God, no way. And so you're, it makes everything else you just said completely irrelevant. Did you make that up? I don't know. I thought everyone did that. You thought that that was like a street joke. Like, yeah, like me and my brother. Like it's common domain. Well, yeah, but then me and my brother like burn each other because if you're telling a really like boring story, yeah. you're like, did you find five dollars? Oh after my god, that? that's so funny. <laughs> yeah. well, my jo- my joke about that is in that universe is that I go like once a week. My dad will call me and he'll be like, "The craziest thing happened." I'm like, "What?" He'll be like, "I was at the hardware store and I was and I was talking to someone and they had heard of you." And I was like, "That's not the craziest thing. <laughs> that's not a story." Is that the, even. Is that I mean, the crazy? That is a fact. Yeah, that's yeah, not yeah, that's a just story. A thing that happened. That is a fact about your day. Yeah, I find that very often people will come up to me and they'll be like i have the craziest story oh and then and then they tell it and you go you're kind of waiting for the story to start but actually last night i was i was doing this benefit show um where a guy actually told me one that was pretty good like when he first met his wife like his i think his i think it was his mother-in-law um was making chicken and they ran out of chicken and then she offered uh she was like she was offering everybody more chicken and someone said yes and there wasn't chicken so she literally did the thing where she covered uh, bones with skin and put it on someone's plate and then the person (laughs) was just like but what it this is not chicken and it was like one of the rare moments where i was like this is a pretty good story was this a party or just like what's happening? Yeah, it was like him. I think it was him meeting his wife many years ago and it was like is the in-laws did people watch it happen I think so. I think it was like pretty outward facing at the party. Like it was a thing that happened. I know. And I was like, I have so many questions. No, but I don't have the answers. It's not my story. (laughs) But I did. I said to him, I go, usually people tell me stories that are not that great. And that actually is kind of a great tidbit. I would love for someone to tell me that story for 10 minutes with every detail that I possibly (sighs) could get. All right. But back to you performing. So, okay, then this is the key. This is the key pivot. This is where it becomes actualized. Yeah. What's the upside of you telling a story on stage? Um, I conquer one of my greatest fears, and it's a huge success. And I Two. keep doing it. Three. And I become wildly successful Four. as a stand-up comedian. And okay. I have a lot of fun doing it. That's five. I'll give you six. You make people happy. Oh, yeah. I think you would. We can do it. You'd make people happy. Thank you. People I would be so that. happy. Thank you. I just think there's there's nothing that compares to the live experience. Although, yeah. I have to say, like, what is the thing that when you're making these videos that's most gratifying? So I've talked about it a little bit. I have three, like, values that I – it sounds so serious, but, like, I have three values that I, I, I cycle every single piece of content through is or filter through is – to make people feel no, like known, loved, and like they belong, Aww. and which is like so sappy. It's like that's not funny, that's sappy. but but with all of that's when I tell stories that 
people can relate to, that's like the known. It's like, that's why it's funny is like, that's me in that story. Or yeah. like when I encourage people, I want them to feel loved if they don't have that in their life. And like, like they belong. I want to build that community in my content, which is why I'm always in my comments and why I don't tell jokes that put other people down. And like, that's just because that's my style of comedy. Yeah. And so those three things are my goal. And so while that might not sound funny, comedy can happen through those and still bring a lot of value to people's life. So at the end yeah. of the day, the laugh is great, but that's not the end goal. It's to make people feel known, loved, or like they belong. This is called yeah. the slow round. Um, what's, a, what's a song that makes you cry? Oh gosh. I'm, <laughs> this answer is gonna be very unexpected. I'm not like a religious person, but during Christmas time, when I hear Mary, did you know, it really gets me. <laughs> I don't know it. Can the, you sing the melody? The, Mary, did you know when your baby boy did da, 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 give sight to a blind man? It's like, ta it's a song talking to Mary about her son. Like, did you know your son was going to be Jesus? Like, I it's, think this must be like a local Omaha thing. It's really not. I Clay Aiken saying it. Oh, really? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I know. Dare, have you, you heard know? of it? Yeah, oh, okay, yeah. okay. Oh, it's a big song. It's a huge song. Oh, it's a big song. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. But it's feel it because now, especially being a mom, I don't that song. I'm just like my son's gonna be great one day. <laughs> like it's a very it's your a son's gonna be Jesus. No, no. But it like it's a very powerful image of like talking to a mom about like, did you have any clue like? what your son would do one oh, day. Oh, that's sweet. Yeah. It's a little bit like Dear Theodosia's like that. Yeah. Where it's like emotional. It is. In this kind of a letter to my child. Yeah. Kind now, of whether you believe the, the the stories that are being sung about, yeah. the theme is like, this man did these great things and you're singing to the mom of this man of like, did you have any clue he would do? And that's a very powerful image. That song always makes me cry. Yeah, that's a good one. What about you? Um, I Can't Make You Love Me, Bonnie Raitt. Okay. What's a specific place um, that isn't your home that where you feel like home? Man. That isn't my home that I feel like home. This isn't like a place, but it's like a place within any place is on the floor mm. behind like a chair or couch where I'm like hiding. I love that. It feels so dark. <laughs> No, no, I don't think it's dark. I really like being in small spaces that feel like my own, that I'm like, I'm good. No one's going to come, like, bother me here. I, you look like a cat. Good, yeah, I'm a cat. My cats do that. Yeah, I'm a they, cat. You can you have cats? No, I, I am a cat. You are a cat, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but like, yeah, my cats go places, and we're like, I guess the cats ran away. <laughs> like, I think she died down there. I don't really know. <laughs> but, but we can't find them. Yeah. We're just like, I guess they got out. Yeah. That was like always my signal to my roommates that like I would work on the floor. I'd have my laptop on the ground and we had a table. We have chairs like I could have gone anywhere, but we had a couch that was like um, kind of back to facing like the sliding door to our balcony. And I would lay on the floor and do all my homework there. And it was kind of like this unspoken thing of like if I'm here, kind of just like life is a little bit too much and I yeah. just want to be here and do my work and I'll come out and everything will be good and we don't have to talk about it. Yeah. <laughs> so that's that's a very good like hard read set for me. I love that. Thanks. I have a deep connection to like my parents' childhood carpet. Mm. Like when I was a kid, their bedroom carpet in the summer when, because they had the only air conditioning unit in the house. <sighs> and so when it got super hot in Massachusetts in the summer and it got really I would go in and sleep on the floor, and I remember and the, the smell of the carpet. Would the carpet get cold if you if like yeah. you walked in? I love that. It's nice. Oh. I'm very yeah, it's very nostalgic for me. Um, <laughs> you talk about this one of your stories. Maybe you don't want to do it. Do you remember the toughest crush from your childhood? <sighs> yeah, I do. <laughs> <laughs> I do. It was a boy I really, really liked, and and we dated, and he was like my best friend, and we actually dated twice. The first time, he asked me out as a prank, and like yes, yeah, classic. and then we like dated, but we like, didn't talk for the whole week. We dated, and then like I got broken up with by like a casual conversation, like we're not dating still, right? Right, of course. Um, and the second time we. Um, we dated for like a year and we were like best friends and we just never, we were never meant to date. We were always meant to be best friends, but we didn't know that because you think if you like someone and they're the opposite gender and you're in high school, then the natural next step is like, then we should date, but like never like just stay friends. Yeah. And we, uh, we dated and then one day we were like, 
we should just go back to being best friends. Mm. And uh, we just did and nothing changed. Like we were just like Aww. very, very good friends and we still communicate today. And it's like really, really sweet. What's really, your really takeaway from the experience? I think that like not everything that you, not everything that's good needs to be elevated to be more than that. Like sometimes right. you're, it's okay that like something that's like, good it just leave it at good it just doesn't have it to be. be like great like yeah like, because great could ruin good and like just leave it good sometimes this is a section of the show called from the notebook oh yes and it's <laughs> i'll start with this one um one morning i'm at a cafe and i dropped una was three at the time at the, like musical camp or ballet or some kind of group activity where you can leave your child for three hours it could have been like a a bin that said toddlers and i would be like dropped her in and been like enjoy bin class <laughs> and so i'm with the other like bin class parents at the cafe <laughs> and and i'm exhausted I'm holding a coffee and i look up to sort of take in the nature of the day and from about 30 feet in the air a bird shits in my eye like directly into my eye and first of all great aim bird oh, no. way to go bird no. you really nailed it second of all if this hasn't happened to you all you need to know is that anything dropped from 30 feet in the air in your eye hurts physically a oh, lot yes but when the cumbersome liquid pellet is fecal matter it hurts spiritually <laughs> it's a whole emotional and i shouted i go ah. <laughs> Or as my daughter, Una, used to use when describing her favorite dinosaur, the hooting hydrosaur, I squawked. I squawked. <laughs> I'm going to need to hear an example of it that. It was like, ah! Okay. <laughs> so the moment I squawked, my friend Rob, who is with me, knows I'm a comedian, looks over to me. And he goes, well, it's good material. Yeah. And I was like, Rob, there's, um, there's still bird shit in my eye. <laughs> This is something you say after I've cleaned it up. It's comedy, comedy strategy plus time, and yeah. I still have the bird. There's shit no time the yet. Yeah, yeah. We need it. We need it. We're gonna need it. Yeah, we're minutes. zero seconds past. Um, and uh, and and uh, I jog back into the coffee shop. I ask for a glass of water. Flush my eye with water. On the plus side, um, the bird shit really woke me up. <laughs> Which was the point of the cafe in the first place, right? And then... Oh uh, God, that's so disgusting. The coffee was nice, but the 70 mile an hour bird shit delivery really closed the deal. It really, it I feel like they could market that as a bird shit latte. You drink two <laughs> shots of espresso, a bird shits in your eye, 40 bucks. A charte. Exactly. In Northern California, they'd call it a bird shit cleanse. Oh my God. People would say, have you done the bird shit cleanse? Fun. A little expensive. But they do have to pay the pigeon wrangler. Yeah. Um, anyway, my <laughs> my bird shit experience drove home a larger point in my life, which is that comedy is tragedy plus time, or at very least pain plus a year. <laughs> so as I arrive at middle age, I've started to zero in on my purpose. And I think it's to share stories that weren't funny at the time, but I'd like to think are funny now. And of course, I'm just mocking myself, to be clear. Uh, um, be, in my stories because in my stories for the most part I'm the joke later yeah which is harkens back to a, a like, line from another no special. hate to the bird I loved the bird I just go really exactly yeah, yeah yeah the target of the joke yeah, is the yeah, bird yeah. somehow <laughs> Like, let me get this, like, I want you to go straight. I am not against birds. Like, so driving that home of, like, no one literally thought you were anti-birds until you are trying to convince me you're not. No, exactly, <laughs> exactly. And also Rob is maybe the villain, although Rob is, he's really just saying something that's true. Yeah, yeah, he's yeah. He's like, oh, that'll be something. That'll, yeah. And it is. The, the, uh, it, I think that comedy is, is, you know, tragedy plus time. And you're like, at least pain plus a year. It's, yeah that is like that's a really good point of the story where you it goes from funny to like heartfelt is yeah. like that that's a good little like turn the corner there that moment thanks yeah it's funny like i you're obviously your podcast is funny because it's true yeah and it's like, when you're you yeah you and i like play in the similar sandbox or playing the same sandbox of telling stories and it's like i always tell people you know, 
write, you know, write down what you're saddest about or angriest about in a journal. Yeah. Sometimes for yourself, like it's helpful to just contextualize your life as yeah. a story. And when you can see your life as a story, you can zoom out and encourage the main character to make better decisions. Yeah. Well, I mean, honestly, I attribute a lot of my memory of like back in the day because I have done so much journaling. Yeah. That it really like I remember reading back what I wrote and that act of like writing, reading and like internalizing helps you understand what you're experiencing and then it also helps you remember it. And so yes. it's really interesting, like if you are in a creative in any way, whether it is writing or it's art or anything, I always suggest writing things down because it allows you to add another layer of emotion where it's like you experience things through somebody else in yeah. yourself. Like you see it the way another person would see it in your life. The things are funny just sometimes because they're true is like a really, really beautiful thing because I think too, as things are going really horribly in your life, like... I have learned to laugh about them because I know they will be funny later because yeah. I've made them funny now from 10 years ago. And so honestly, it's, it might be labeled as like a trauma response of just like laughing when something horrible happens, you know, yeah. like that might not be healthy. But if you can do it in a healthy way, I think it's like a very good way to separate yourself from like horrible things that are happening at the moment. No, I think that's absolutely true. Yeah. Let's see. Do you have any stories you're working out or do you want me to just continue and tell you one more story? Tell me one more story. Okay, great. Usually I just do jokes. But since you're a storyteller, I'm like, I'll tell you stories. I love it. All right. A few years ago, Jenny and I rented a house in the country for the holidays. And it was very special um, and, and until we um, turned on the heat. Oh, and then there, there just wasn't heat. Oh, no. Oh, no. And it's Thanksgiving. I called the oil company. And they said they could, they could come that night between 6.30 and 9.30 p.m. with 10 gallons of oil to prime the heating system, make sure it's ready for one of those like super tankers of oil that drive around. And, and before this incident, I didn't even know what those things uh, did. Uh, I did. I just saw them driving around. I thought maybe maybe those guys just are just dr driving around. Like, and they, uh, and they're listening <laughs> maybe to they AM. they really like driving. <laughs> yeah, they just like driving. They're listening to AM talk radio. They're making jokes on the CB radio. Maybe they're just perpetually driving in circles using the oil in the tank. That, that's just a reserve gas tank. Exactly. Yeah. So the window was 6.30 to 9.30, and I wait in the doorway. And because it's the, one of those things where the, I'm like, I'm not, I'm not going to miss the window. No. And I'm like a goaltender. I'm like blocking the, the front For steps. three hours. For three hours. And no one showed up. I called the company. The company's called Petro. And I said, hey, it's 9.30. No one showed up. My, you know, And they said... Our guy said he showed up. No one answered the door. He left a little card on your door. I go, I'm on the door. No card. I've been here the whole time. And I didn't shout, but I was angry. Yeah. He could sense this. And then he replied, happy Thanksgiving, which felt passive aggressive. That, what, did, he, did he hang up? He was, no, he just said, happy Thanksgiving. <laughs> and it was a good tactical move in hindsight. It forced happy me to say happy Thanksgiving to you, too. <laughs> like angry. Like, happy Thanksgiving to you, too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, happy Thanksgiving. I said, happy Thanksgiving to you, too. Even though he was completely fucking me over in real time and lying to me. <laughs> like the pilgrims. Um, so the guy, so the Petra guy says, the technician will come over to your house that he's after the house he's currently at. Get a phone call at 1030. It's the technician. And he says, I'm a half hour away. I say, I'll stay up all night. So the man from Petro shows up at 11.15 p.m. He gets out of the van. He says, I am Pedro. And I'm looking at his truck. It says Petro. And I'm exhausted. Like, I'm like out of it. And I'm thinking, there's no way his name is Pedro. And he works for a company named Petro. I can't possibly call him Pedro. <laughs> because <laughs> he might be like, why would you call me the name of my company? And I'd be so embarrassed. So I go, come on in, man. And it got me self-conscious about Safe. my use of the word man. Yeah. I was like, Pedro's got to be 10 years older than me. I'm using the casual man all of a sudden. So then I, I modified. I go, right this way, sir. And then I thought, what am I? Some kind of weird blue-blooded rich guy who calls everyone sir. <laughs> so Pedro and I work on this for a little bit, which means he works on it. I bring him tea. Yeah. At 1 a.m., Pedro says, I don't know what to tell you, Mike. I cannot fix this thing. I said, okay, sir. He tried to call his company, but his phone was doing an update. So I said, I'll call them. 
I said, hi, this is Mike Birbiglia. I'm here with, and I could see in Pedro's eyes that he really thought I should know his name by now. I said, the man from your company. <gasps> um, I'm going to put him on speaker so he can identify himself and explain the rest. So I put him on speaker and he says, hi, this is Pedro. I said, Got it. Got it. In an evening full of failures, at least I know his name is Pedro. From that point on, I use the name Pedro a lot. <laughs> And I commit it to memory by a mnemonic device, which is Pedro works for Petro. So Pedro tells me this is way over his head and that he's going to send a technician in the morning. First thing to fix it. Then he tells me to call Petro in the morning and explain that I have that I have a baby and that this is dangerous. He knows I do not have a baby. He, we, he knows my daughter's five. We've talked about our kids at this point. We've spent a lot of time together. Yeah. Me and Pedro. Um, but apparently... If you want heat, you really have to raise the stakes. <laughs> you have to say you have a baby. And so in the morning, I wake up, I call, I go, you got to understand we got a baby. This baby might die. <laughs> oh, no. And you're all, you're all going to hell. Happy Thanksgiving. <laughs> Happy Thanksgiving. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. And so oh. at 1 p.m., I, um this guy charlie comes over and charlie goes i'm gonna get you heat and there's something about charlie's confidence that makes me feel like he's gonna get his heat yeah it also made me want to have sex with charlie even though i'm <laughs> heterosexual man happily married i just thought charlie's looking good you're saving the day yeah yeah, yeah. you're saving my hypothetical baby yeah Char <laughs> this is the line i wrote i might get it out but i wrote it for today i wrote charlie brought the heat which made me want to give him the heat <laughs> Maybe it's too much. Maybe it's too much. Char yeah. <laughs> it might be too much. It's something in that universe. Because I've done this on stage a couple of times and made me, it made me want to have sex with Charlie is actually the biggest line in it right now. Yeah. <laughs> because I think there's something relatable about when someone, anyone, is wildly competent. Yeah. And you've been dealing with complete and total incompetence. Like you're just like, oh, I'm all, I mean, I'm attracted to this person. I think person we'll be even. physically intimate. Yes, I think we'll be, I think it's time that we're physically intimate. Yeah. <laughs> An hour later, Charlie fixes the heat, and I have a hundred dollar bill in my wallet and nothing else. I never use cash; it just I ran a hundred dollar bill. Charlie fixes the heat. I hand him a hundred dollar bill. He goes, "No, no, it's not a tipping thing." And you never know. And then I put, I, I take his hand, and I, I, I put a hundred dollar bill in his hand, and I go, "Happy Thanksgiving." <laughs> 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 Um, so anyway, that's a new story. I've been doing that for uh, six weeks or something. The baby situation is getting worse and worse to me is the funniest line. That is the that's line. interesting. That is like this <laughs> because it makes no sense. It makes no sense. But it it, it conveys the entire idea of the in, the whole story is the baby situation is getting worse and worse. There's yes. so much in that sentence. You know, and maybe, and it just as we're talking about it out loud, of like having the what made me want to have sex with Charlie. I mean, it made me want to have sex with Charlie, which goes to the the source of, of I think the reason I'm fixing the heat in the first place is I want my wife to want to have sex with me the way that I want to have sex with Charlie. <laughs> I right? want to be Charlie. I want to be. Charlie. I want to I'm be Charlie. To be Charlie. That makes sense. I mean, maybe that's what the story's about. You want to fix it. You want to fix it. I mean, like, there's a dual purpose happening in the story. And in, in, in real life, certainly. It's like, I'm always trying to impress my wife. I'm always trying to be, like, uh, awesome. And then uh, <laughs> and then with my daughter, I'm just trying to... I mean, the, the whole thing of being a parent is about make sure they stay alive and warm. Yeah. So you're I, just like, I got to get them heat. Well, I think it... Honestly, that story, to cap it, might be funny if you I start with the idea of like because you're on vacation right yeah and yeah, yeah. if this is a crossing a line tell me but like no, if you're on vacation, there is no crossing line. like vacation sex right okay great so you're like i want this to be a nice fun experience but you don't have warmth you are trying to get this fixed charlie finally leaves or whatever you go and then after this whole wait, his name is charlie right? yeah yeah this whole situation is like now i want to have sex with charlie because like he's fixed this problem for me and he leaves and then you're like the door closes and you're like where were we? Like kind oh, of like resuming this, like this is a way too long of a setup for a very simple premise of like things that just happen in normal life. Also, that could not be funny in any way. And then you no, found no, $5. No, I think that's interesting. I think that there, it's worth an experiment actually to do something in the universe of talking about 
my relationship with my wife and I'm always trying to impress her. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, one, one time we were on vacation, blah, 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 and there was no heat and I was yeah. like, I'm going to save the day. Yeah, more like that. You know like, what I mean? You want to fix the situation. Yeah, yeah. And, then, and then like they leave and you're just like, I did it. And I told we, you I would do it. And then we had sex <laughs> and I pretended it was Charlie. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> ah. I don't think, I think we're telling different stories. No, no, no. <laughs> it's yes ending and wherever it goes, it goes. No, I think that's, I, I love that. And I, I think, that, yeah, there's a lot. Well, in a lot of the stuff I'm talking about in, on stage lately in the Working It Out shows has been about marriage and domesticity. And I'm trying to figure out, and I wonder if you deal with this with, with your videos, because I think you have probably a really young audience, actually, is like, you you probably have a lot of fans who aren't married, don't, maybe are in, in a relationship and relate to what you're doing. It's like, why, why do you think they relate to you talking about being married? I, you'd be shocked. The the widest demographic I have is women that are like 35 to 45 married, married. and like okay. in relationships. And yeah. so I find it harder actually to create content that people relate to when I am talking about like younger things, yeah. which is really like everyone can relate to a funny story from your childhood. So you yeah. don't have to be that age to relate to that. But like a lot of the stuff when I, like I don't talk about being a mom a lot, but when I do, it is like, all the comments of like, oh my God, me too. And like yes. people are looking for that. And yes. so to me, it's like, that's where I, I see the most un, uh, like I don't expect that kind of relatability because I just forget that people connect to me that are not my age. It's really interesting. So the final thing we do is called working it out for a cause. And it's any organization that you think does a good job and we contribute to them and then we link to them in the show notes. Yes, I like National Birth Equality Collaborative. Mm -hmm. um, at, so the United States is like the only industrialized like country that the um, maternal mortality rate is like increasing all of the time. Yes. We have like not figured it out. And especially for like um, marginalized communities, like black pregnant people like yeah. are, do not get the care that they need. Yeah. And it's just wild to me. And, and once I became pregnant, I just realized how scary it is that you just rely on the people around you. And like, you just have to trust people that you know yeah. nothing about and your life is just like in someone else's hands. So uh, this organization just basically like really focuses on care uh, for people in like just marginalized communities that they get the, the care that they need when they're pregnant, after birth, like the, the babies, like before birth and after, like all of it, it's just a complete situation. And it's- Well, I'm gonna contribute to them. We're right. gonna link to them in the show notes, encourage people to contribute as well. Yeah. Elise, this is uh, such a joy. And yeah. then our next, our next goal is we, we got to get you on stage yep. telling stories yeah. to a group of strangers yes. because it's going to bring joy to the world. We're going to do it. Yeah. I'm going to shake on that. We're going to shake. I promise. <laughs>